Welcome back to the Iron Sights Podcast. I've got Andrew Siepka, uh, who's out in Hawaii. Andrew, welcome to the show, my man. Thanks for having me, brother. I appreciate it. Um, I'm always appreciative of people that share their time with me and their message. And uh, this one is uh, a, kind of a special one for me because of what I've learned about you since I've been sort of introduced to you, which really I, people hear me talk about sort of my, my um, I, I guess my challenges with social media and the things that exist there. Uh, but at the same time, without it, I wouldn't have the connections that I have. And so I, I am grateful for it in, in that, in that sense. And so when I came across you, what I, what I got like immediately was you're just a dude that's trying to leave the world in a better place than you found it. And uh, I'm like, I got to talk to this guy a little bit more. So uh, again, I'll say this at risk of overdoing it. Thank you for joining me and us. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, man, the pleasure is all mine. And you kind of said it right there. I'm just, I had a friend tell me a long time ago, just try to be a good dude and that'll, it'll all work out. And You know, he was, he was right so far. So let's, let's keep the train rolling. Let's, um, Let's dig into a little bit. So I, I, I'll just give people sort of a, a, an overview of why I've asked you to be on the show. And then aside from sort of what I, uh, your, your, your mission sort of as a human has been and is. Uh, but then like maybe we can kind of just talk a little bit about your background so that you can you, you give them some sense of kind of who you are and where you've come from and, and uh, give them some context. But I, I think the... The, the sort of the initial thing that we connected on was the fact that you're a strength and conditioning coach. You, you hold the distinction of being a certified strength and conditioning coach, which is really more or less like a, a postgraduate certificate in the world of human performance. Um, mm-hmm. And anybody in this world understands what, those, what that acronym means. Um, but with that acronym, it, it comes with your experience just sort of in the world of fitness, but also you have a military background you served in the Marine Corps for many years. I definitely want to get into that because I think what you did was unique. Uh, there's also a Coast Guard background there, um, maybe in some special operations that we can talk about. Um, you also ha- uh, went to school and uh, hold a degree in uh, in the field of mental health, which is also very unique. And you've tied that into the, the things that you do now, which are providing training. You are a strength and conditioning coach for the Marine Corps on base there in Hawaii. And then you also yeah. have your own business, which, which, um, uh, you know, you're, you're providing health, fit, health and fitness services and, and coaching to as well. So there's a lot going on here. And so I just want to kind of put that out there to the listener, because as we get into this, I want people to kind of understand where we're going and maybe why we're going the directions we are. So I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to say this. You get to start and stop wherever you want. You, okay. just, In terms of telling us who you are and what you're about, you just got to be patient with me because I might time you out a couple of times to just get some clarification on some things. So ready, set, go. Awesome. And let me preface this too with um, the, the where I am now, if you were to ask this 10, 12 years ago, or even when I was a, a little kid, never did I think that I would be uh, in the position I am and it wasn't through triumph at all. It was just a lot of um, falling on my face and just having to figure it out. So um, let me start it off by um, originally from Wakefield, Massachusetts. It's uh, on the North Shore of Mass. It's about eight miles out of the city of Boston. So I grew up there. <clears throat> my parents divorced when I was young. So I have a blended family. Um, I have a bunch of stepbrothers and stepsisters and we all, you know, we all get along, but I'm the only one who, when I was younger, I was kind of like, I don't want to use the term black sheep, but I was very hard headed and stubborn. So if I wanted to do something, I was going to do it. And it was more like, I'd rather ask for, or, you know, ask for an apology or apologize for something than ask for permission, I guess you could say. Um, and that drove my parents kind of mm-hmm. crazy. Um, played lacrosse in high school, was pretty good at it. Um, not talent wise, just I've always had a decent work ethic. Um, so I'm short, I'm a little guy. So I figured, what I can, what I can't make up for, for my height and all this, I can, I can be physical. I can armor up my body. I can get mentally tough and I can kind of figure out how to do this stuff and just work hard. Um, captained my high school lacrosse team, thought I was going to go to college and play lacrosse, tried to do that, but drank my way out of school right away. Um, Mm -hmm. I thought I was there to have fun. Wasn't mentally mature enough, honestly, in my head to deal with that. 
Um, and my parents at the time were like, well, you had an opportunity and we are not going to bail you out of this. If you want to go back to school, you can figure out how to pay for it or you can start working. So I started working for a moving company. Um, I worked for a moving company in high school in the summer. So I was familiar with the work, which if anyone else has done that before or just helped a buddy move, definitely not something I was looking forward to at 18 years old. Um, but it kind of set a foundation for me because they treated me like a man right away. And these are like rough dudes who have histories. They're working there for a reason, right? But they were, they were fair to me. I, had to, I definitely had to learn how to earn my money and earn respect. Um, learned very fast that that was a hard way to make a living. Um, went back to community college, saved up enough money to go to community college. And that kind of gave me enough in me to realize I could start accomplishing tasks. Um, but trying to do what I was doing right now to go to college wasn't going to be the thing. So I actually wasn't a Marine. That's a title I've never heard. I didn't want to cut or earn. I didn't want to cut you off when you said it. I've never had the privilege of being a Marine, but I've had the privilege of deploying with them and working with them. So I'll open that up a little bit uh, later on down the line. Okay, good. Um, okay, yeah, okay so got, I it. Originally, got it. I misunderstood. I might have misunderstood that. No worries, man. I know my story is kind of all over the place. And that's kind of the funny part of it because it's just been like, peaks and valleys and just making it all blend together, honestly. Um, so okay. I went and started talking to recruiters. The reason I ended up choosing the Coast Guard was because when I talked to my dad, he was like, well, they also do law enforcement. I have a friend who is in the Coast Guard. He said, it's a good quality of life. If you want to get out, you can be a cop. They're federal. They're in the Department of Homeland Security. So if you want to go to an alphabet agency, you know, it, it makes sense. So I'm like, Okay. Yeah, whatever. Cause I didn't have the intention. Like I wasn't, I didn't go in wanting to stay in. I went in to serve, do something bigger than me. Cause I was selfish with my, you know, the opportunities I had. And I wanted to earn that ability to pay for an education, but I wanted to also get out of the place I was cause it wasn't bringing me anywhere fast. Like once I got back to my hometown, when I left college, I was like, Ooh, dude, this is, this sucks. Like, like that facade of like, whatever's going on, like when you graduate to when you leave and come back, like it was a house of cards. So when like, it was a hard reality for me and my parents not helping me was huge because it made me start making decisions as a man. Cause I was trying to play the grown man game without understanding grown man responsibility yet. Um, got it. So I ended up joining the coast guard in 2006. Um, and I served from 2006 to 2012. Now, while I was in, I had the opportunity to try out for what is now called the Deployable Specialized Forces. Back then, it was called the Deployable Operations Group, which is like the Coast Guard's like uh, high-risk maritime interdiction teams. So they're the guys that are, you know, going out, busting drugs, anti-piracy, counterterrorism. Um, the schoolhouses after the selection we go through are on Camp Lejeune. They're on a Marine Corps base. So that's how we end up having that connection. Um, the schoolhouse is actually called Got Special it. Missions Training Center. Um, so we spent some time with that. Marines. Yeah, because, I mean, if you think about it, anyone who's amphibious or in a maritime environment, we're going to find ways to that operate makes with each other. Yeah. yeah, and the unique thing about Coasties yeah. is when we say we go on Navy vessels or, you know, we're operating with other branches, when we raise our ensign now we have a federal jurisdiction over what's going on so that's how you end up seeing a lot of these teams or even you see these things with the navy where you see team like navy doing big drug busts there's coasties there too just no one knows that we're there like you know when i ended up in iraq i remember a lot of running into soldiers and marines and sailors and they're like dude what the hell are you guys doing here and it's like well there's water somewhere like we'll <laughs> find it you know and <laughs> Right. Um, very unique opportunity. I can't even tell you that's like what I wanted to do. I was a young dude full of piss and vinegar. I felt like I had something to prove. I was the perfect combination of preparation meets opportunity because I was always an athlete. I always stayed in shape. I've always been a hard worker. I've always raised my hand to take on tasking. So when I had the opportunity to try out PT test is the first step, right? Non-negotiable exceed all expectations of PT. Excellent. You have, a, you have an opportunity to try. Then you go through your selection, break it down into bite-sized pieces, you know, day by day, meal by meal, evolution by evolution, whatever it is. Um, 
you know, I know you listen to a couple of the other podcasts and if anyone else does, cause we're going to cover a lot. So I'm going to encourage other people to do the same. Um, I, I was always really good at keeping my, my world small as far as just like when stuff was getting crazy, I just count in my head and just count and just, and I don't know if that's growing up with a bunch of siblings or what, but you just learn things don't always go your way and you never really get your way and you're always compromised in life. Um, so I was just, I was able to kind of adapt to my situations that were going on. Um, like I said, never been super skilled. I'm five foot seven. I'm 200 pounds. Um, you know, I come from Polish immigrant grandparents on my dad's side who were refugees from World War II. And then my mom's side is a bunch of, you know, Boston Irish blue collar plumbers and carpenters and just rough dudes. So every person I grew up around was a hard worker. Like you didn't, I didn't sleep let's in when t- I was a little kid at 6 a.m. Let, yeah, let's, let's actually, let's talk about that for a second. Just kind of the upbringing. And you mentioned, you know, kind of being mm-hmm. hard headed. There was the lacrosse background, being an athlete, living in Massachusetts. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, a couple of things, just maybe being able to compartmentalize maybe a little bit mm-hmm. more. Uh, you mentioned the counting thing, we met lots of siblings, mixed family. Th- th- there's a lot of things going on there that I think probably quite a few people can relate to. Can you mm-hmm. talk just about, and, and, and I think, because I think this relates later, can you talk about the male influence in your life during that time? Like as, as you were growing up, I mean, you just yeah. mentioned real quick that your, your grandparents were Polish immigrants. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about like <clears throat> with, you know, as a, as a young man, very young man trying to kind of figure it out on your own, what were mm-hmm. some of the things that were instilled into you then that you maybe not didn't understand that show mm-hmm. up for you later as we kind of continue down the story? Ooh, okay. So, um, my male influences in my life, that's, were kind of unique because like I said, my, my parents split up when I was young. Um, I don't want to say anything about my parents. Obviously I wasn't in their shoes. I wasn't in their situation. They had kids young. We all know as adults, how life kind of can just throw curveballs at us really quick. I'll just say my parents did the best that they could with whatever they were given. Um, I would have liked to have more out of my real father in my life. I have a good relationship with him now, so I don't hang myself up on it. Um, but that confused me a lot. It led me to uh, performance and performance trying to be the thing to get acceptance. And then when I didn't necessarily get the acceptance I wanted, it forced me to continue to excel and push. And um, like, oh, the next thing will be the thing that gets the attention. And then my stepfather very loving, very kind, showed me a lot of love, but on all those like soft skills, hard skills in life, we didn't always see eye to eye. Um, so as good as he was to me, my inclination as a child was like, well, this isn't my dad. So beat it, Mm -hmm. you know? And that's something for me as an adult male. Now I do my best to try to like, listen, man, I am so sorry for that. Um, you know, and just express where I was coming from at the time, because I think that's really, really important for people because he may have known that as a kid, but him know, or me as a kid and understanding what I was doing, but him hearing it come from my mouth as a man is going to be way different. Um, so I spent mm-hmm. a lot of my childhood confused and punchy and angry and not really feeling accepted. And, um, Like I was really good at like kind of wearing masks and like blending in with groups and like being able to like be a jock and be friendly with this group and be friendly with, you know, the other group of kids or whoever it was. Um, In high school, I actually got voted friendliest in my class. And at first I thought, oh my God, that's so cool. But I realized for me, that was because it's a huge defense mechanism to just be accepted by everyone. Yeah, I think the, 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 this because of what I, a little bit of what I know about you, I had some questions there, just kind of like how this, how, how does this show up for you later? And we're going to get to that, I think, Mm -hmm. and kind of how you handled, you know, situations in your life. You've already sort of mentioned like the competition perspective, like that is like whatever I got to do to win and maybe, and, and I get validation from that, but Mm -hmm. like internally, but also externally, and I get a little attention. And so like, I think this relates to the fitness piece. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kind of the, the, you, you mentioned that you use the term performance, but the, you know, like if I, if I stay on top of my game, if I work harder than the other guy, then I'm mm-hmm. going to win out in this and that working hard 
uh, alongside with of that also comes some suffering. And so if you're mm-hmm. not suffering, then you're probably not working hard enough in your mount, in your mind, right? And mm-hmm. so then if you're, you know, so if it if it doesn't hurt, if it's if it's if it's not really, really hard for 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 lack of a better term, mm-hmm. then I'm not working hard enough, which can lead to kind of some interesting behaviors. But yeah. it's interesting that you chose the Coast Guard. Can we go back to the Coast Guard? You said that you, mm-hmm. you know, you 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 talked to your dad and your dad said, like, hey, this is this is kind of what it entails. But there were there's other branches of the military. Sorry, I was mistaken about the uh about mm-hmm. the Marine Corps thing. No worries. I think I I crossed over and and sort of listened to your stories, but do you Go back to that. Like, why did you, like, what was driving you to do that and maybe not join the military? Right, and when I, I say military, the, I mean the yeah. conventional military. Yeah. No, I, I, I've heard I've heard it all, man. And honestly, it was the law enforcement piece. Um, there Got was it. the fact that they, like, we have our boarding officers go to a federal law enforcement training center, right? Which is where a yeah. lot of other alphabet agencies end up going to. So, like, that really, that to me was like, okay, well, if we have this huge dump going in, during these wars and all these other things that are going on and we're creating shooters, cops, yeah, you're a shooter, but you also have to be a thinking shooter also. So it made me think in that, like, it's going to make me understand use of force, um, you know, like what officer presence is, understanding laws and jurisdictions. And then that way, when I would go to either like Mass State Police or whatever it was, I would have this like leg up because now I already understood law. I understood some of these things. So it was going to help kind of me advance. I was thinking more four or five years down the line when that enlistment was over than like, oh, what am I doing in this moment? Because what I was doing in that moment was getting me already in trouble by like having to drop out of school and all these other things. So my oh, gut chance it. originally was like, I want to join the Navy. And my parents were like, what do you want to join the Navy for? What are you going to do? And I was like, I don't know. I'm just going to join the Navy. And they're like, I'm, and I'm th- I was mad when they told me like, you sound like a, F an idiot. And I was mad at them at first because I'm like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, you should be proud of me, blah, 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 blah. And like now being 38 years old, I understand what they were doing. But as a young man, it's like, what? You don't believe in me? I'll show you. I'll fine. So I like did this deep in where it's like, okay, I'll give them what they want, but I'm also still going to get what I want and get out of here. Yeah. I think a little bit of this, uh, the reason I'm asking the question is just kind of develop this a little bit. And that is, mm-hmm. I think the Coast Guard is very misunderstood by a majority of people. If you don't live, for sure. if you're living in Massachusetts, you're living in New York, you're living on anywhere along the coast, uh, along the coast, particularly on the East Coast, um, you, you know about the Coast Guard. You, th- yep. This is a this is another law enforcement agency that is, is as active as any other law enforcement agency uh, in, in your cities or whatnot. And, and again, going mm-hmm. in like those port or coastal towns. But the, mostly, the, the majority of the United States has zero clue what any of yeah. that is. So maybe you, maybe you could talk a little bit about the job and the things that you were training for and the things okay. that you did while you were in to give maybe a little bit more uh, background to, or sure. just, I guess, education to people that don't really understand what that is and, and what it is that the Coast Guard does, particularly okay. the things that you were doing, because that's a little bit different than I think what mm-hmm. most people do. Yeah. And I, I will have to say too, I'm very removed from that community. I still have a couple people that are in there and I know it's made a ton of advancements and I'm, it's super cool to see what some of the boys are doing now, but I'm, I'm kind of out of date. So I'm going to preface this by saying, I'm going to talk from when I was there, my experiences, what it was like for me, um, and just go Fair from enough. there. Um, yeah, because Fair like enough. I, said, and I, think, I, I think people will really respect that, man. Like I, I, I do. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, um, originally I went to school, my trade or a school, cause we follow a lot of the Navy's rank and structure and everything like that. Uh, I was a gunner's mate or what would be classified as GM, which is like base, basic ordnance and small arms repair. Um, the reason I got that tryout spot was because I graduated high in the class and I, I had the highest PT scores and I had, I think I was in the top three academically. So because of that combination, it was like, all right, what do you want to do? What do you want to choose? Um, my original choice was to go to uh, Puerto Rico. I was going to go to air station Barankin. And then I talked to my sister and she was like, dude, when are you going to get the chance to go to Hawaii? And I'm sure now 16 years later, she regrets saying that, but I was like, <laughs> Bet. let's do this 
because you're still there. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I I took I threw my name in the hat, and it wasn't a guarantee. It was like, okay, you're going to go to this this unit, and this unit has this. They have a couple sides to it, and one side is the law enforcement, like they call it it at the time, advanced interdiction teams, advanced interdiction okay. force protection, which is maritime interdiction. Um, and if not, they have like a boat side, and at the time, the boat side was kind of like. If you want to go to a unit like that, you want to do the high speed stuff. And if you're not doing the high speed stuff, it's just kind of like, it's not bad. Like everyone's job is cool. But in my mind, I wanted to be the guy jumping out of the helicopter, not the guy like hanging on on the boat crew doing whatever. You know what I mean? Sounds so like a, a great bit, time. Yeah. And it, as, as a young guy, I was like, well, I kind of liked things that made like it challenged me and scared me a little bit because I was like, oh, dude, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it through this thing. So let's just see. I knew I was in shape. But I didn't know if I was in shape the way that, like, at the time, a tactical athlete needs to be. Or at the time, sure. you know, these things that I get to teach Marines now weren't even talked about to us. It almost felt more like a tough guy contest. If you could survive the beating and you could survive yeah. kind of like the hazing and the ass kicking, welcome to the club. Now you're the new guy. So you're pretty much the bitch on the team until you start earning the respect, get some deployments, you know, go through the schoolhouse, and now you're good to go. Mm-hmm. So I got out to Hawaii. Did a green team selection with the team that was out here, got picked up through that, spent a couple months being kind of like, for lack of a better term, like a range bitch, where I was just like spraying yep. glue on targets and like picking up brass, jamming mags, and just out. But at the time, like where some people would be like, man, I didn't sign up to do this. I was just happy to be around like cool guys who were doing cool stuff that I was like, whoa, right? As like a 22 year old, I'll say kid. At the time, I didn't want anyone to call me a kid. But as a 22-year-old kid, that's when I started to get male role models was when I was around Mm -hmm. guys like that because I was like, oh, shit, like these dudes are hard. Like these dudes are hard. Like they can, they can, they can PT, they can swim, they can run, they can do calisthenics forever. They can talk shit. They can shoot. They can fight. They can, and it was like, oh, like almost like sensory overload where it was like, this is what I've been looking for, you know? So in okay. that same sense of performance, it started to turn into once I made it through the selection, it was like, I need to keep my spot. And I was always a performer. You've arrived. Like, yeah, yeah, it was like, I never got there. And that internally, that initially started to give me anxiety that I wasn't willing to address. That started to bring my, um, we'll say mental downfall, right? But really what I thought was... Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I I got a lot. So No, 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 no. It's okay. I want to I want to ask the question like is this just one of those when I say this I don't want to mi- minimize this at, at all. I yeah. bet I think this is very common particularly when you start to talk to guys that are in the soft community um and on these these particular teams and that is like you're never good enough. And that's what's mm-hmm. going on in your own your own yep. head sort of all the time. It's just I'm not good enough. I I and, and I need to do all these kind of when looking back, I think a lot of these guys look at us. This is just wild, like yep. not productive behaviors, the decision making processes mm-hmm. to somehow overcome this I'm not good enough mentality of, hey, if I don't do uh, the, I mean, what are the fears like in your head? Like, what are the things that are driving this? I think I know the answer to this because I've mm-hmm. asked this question of a lot of guys a lot of times. It's almost the same answers every time. But if you kind of, kind of, have to rank like the fear levels or categories. How do you how do you categorize like what you're the most afraid of doing? Mm-hmm. Which is again this mind fuck for lack of a better term in your head. Yeah, I was more afraid of letting my team down than any sort of like physical fear to myself. That fear of like not want like there was some sort of ease and like hey this shit could get real but we're in it together. And like, hey, I got you. Like, I'm, I'm, I got you to the point that I'm not worried about me. And that, that to me was a huge mo, like motivator and driver. Um, and then also like, try, like I was around so many people who were better than, just better than me, straight up better than me, better shooters, PT studs, like just better men in general. And there was a lot of that, like, earn your spot, make sure you deserve to be here because the worst fear was like, you come in one day. And you find out you don't belong. And that's kind of what happened to me, honestly, because we're going to get into it. So I'm going to bear my soul to you on this because we're doing this to help people and let people see this side of it too. That's part of the reason I'm asking it because, yep. I, you know, not that I've heard you really talk 
but maybe a little bit about this part before, but I like I, I we get in this mentality of yes, I'm always looking out for the guy next to me, and that's more mm-hmm. important than me. And so there's yeah. something bigger uh, than 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 my success. It's some it's it is the success of the team. And I think a lot of people look at that, including myself, look at that. That's very noble. And that mm-hmm. is a that is an extra that is a uh, that that is a very good personal characteristic or trait. But it mm-hmm. also it also is a double edged sword, you know. Yeah. As, you, as you're as you're going down this path, and things aren't always going to go the way you need or want them to go. And I think it comes up later. So th- mm-hmm. that that's the reason I asked the question. I, I'm not trying to preload too much of this. Just that mm-hmm. I was curious, kind of in your mind, like what's going on here. Yeah. As you're around these dudes that are they're impressing you. You're looking up to them. You don't want to let them down. Uh, there's this sense of like a club within a club. Like I finally mm-hmm. arrived here. I don't want to fuck this up. The worst thing yeah. I could do is mess up right now. Mm-hmm. And if I mess up, you know, what are the consequences of that messing up? You know, does it cost yeah. somebody else something? Does it cost me something? Uh, that is a lot to bear. That 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 is a lot yeah. on, on on the shoulders. And you can't always control everything. And I think that's the other thing that comes along with this is trying mm-hmm. to control every single yeah. little thing from, you know, again, how do I look in the mirror naked all the way mm-hmm. to, you know, obviously how does this other person feel or think about me, which is, right. which is wild when you think about all the things that can kind of fit into that spectrum. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, and how, like you said, how wide is that spectrum? And I mean, yeah, exactly. And we can all relate to that in that sense, like whatever it is, but like, yeah, I heard you say it on a podcast and I'm going to say it here too because I think it's important. Anyone who is listening to this, stop comparing yourself to other people right now because you won't get anywhere if you do that. Right. And we'll talk more on that later, but it's yeah. that important that I want to drop it right now too. Yeah, that comparison is an evil bitch. That'll ruin evil, pretty much evil. anything good in your life. If you it almost took much, my life, man. Time there. Like real talk straight up, it almost took my life. So anyone who's struggling with that comparison, well, cut it out now. I, it's, it's such a hard thing to do. I mean, it's easy said yeah. and so hard to do for so many people. But yep. um, yes, we will get there because I, I want to hear about this, um, mm-hmm. some of the detail. So anyway, you. But coming back, you are you are yep. you are training and working with these guys. At some point, mm-hmm. you're now part of the circle. Talk about that. Talk about like what that job is. You know, what are the mm-hmm. things that surround that job? What is it you're doing? Uh, talk about some of those experiences. Cool. So um, my job was to do maritime interdiction. So pretty much tactical law enforcement, think about like a SWAT team on the water. Uh, Or if anyone's familiar with that type of work, like BBSS, um, which is, you know, vessel board search seas or visit board search seas. Sorry, it's been a long time since I've done any of that. Um, But it's pretty much like we're going on ships, whether they know we're coming or not whether we get intel that there's something there on there or not. And we're pretty much taking control and we're finding what we need to find. And we're, you know, whether that's people, drugs, weapons, whatever. So, I mean, I've done, let's just from personal experience, not getting too much into it. I've got deployments to the Middle East, um, specifically Southern Iraq. Um, Spent some time with the Brits and the Marine Corps down there. Um, I've done presidential security when, uh, president Obama was in office a few times when he was out here, winter Olympics, quick reaction force. Um, we've had teams in Africa doing anti-piracy, Southern patrols doing drug work. Um, so it's dynamic. You're doing, you can do a lot of different things. Um, even when I was in Iraq, sometimes we were in armored vehicles driving around, you know, whoever was in the country visiting to do their shake hands, kiss babies. And then the next day we could be yep. going out to the oil platforms to live out there for three weeks. You know, it was, it was just, it always changed. Um, but it was fun. Like I loved it as a 22 year old guy, guy, like I said, you, you said earlier, you were like, man, that's, there's a lot that rides into that. And it, as a young dude, I wasn't processing it. Cause as a young guy, you're like, yeah, I, like I'm in a club. Like when I stepped into a team room, I was like, holy shit. Like, okay. Like, this is what I want. So whatever the job needed, I was down. Like I didn't have, I, I wasn't married. I was single. I was running around. Right. But I was living hard too. Cause when you're running around shooting guns, doing this stuff and you think you're the man, you're out boozing hard, you're doing all of these other things. So I was not taking care of myself too. So it was without even realizing it, compounding stress already through compounding stress of deployments, 
you know, lack of sleep, not really knowing how to process anything besides aggression. That was a tough one for me because anytime I would feel an emotion, I would only know how to turn it into something aggressive. Um, you know, and that would through, through deployments and stuff like that, that would come out with shortness, being, having a temper. Um, you know, those little things that I would start to notice drinking too much. Um, you know, but I copped it up with, Hey, this part of the life, baby, this is what we signed up to do. Let's go. You know, and it was sad because my team leaders looking at it were, were just at the time, like all we did was shoot guns and drink. And like, it was like, shit, man, like looking at it now, I'm like, that is not a life I would, I would want. I don't want to talk bad about anyone, but looking at where I'm at now, I just told you that's all I were, where I wanted to be right now. It's like, I'm trying to tell people there's another way. If this is where you're going to go, there's another way to do this whole thing. Yeah. So I, I think you just, you, you, you hit a lot of notes there that, um, like, I'll just say this. If you listen to enough podcasts, you read enough stories and, uh, or books or whatever else, what you're saying is not uncommon at all. It, mm-hmm. it, it, it is actually the very common tale. It's this constantly trying to stack up. It's being forced into situations where you're, your stress response is being maxed out at a level constantly. You're not helping it generally. When I say you're, I mean the collective, you know, the collective, you know, folks that are on these podcasts or re- or write these yeah. books or whatever, you know, you're, you're engaging in behaviors that are not healthy. They're not conducive to, you know, longevity. And at the same time, you are faced with uh, the prospect on a, on a daily basis, sometimes depending on where you are in the world and what your job happens to be, where your life is on the line, and so you know, oftentimes it looks like the the only outlet is to just be with the guys, be with the team, mm-hmm. and do whatever that team's doing. And it seems it kind of automatically comes along with women, alcohol, you know, or whatever, um, and lots of working out, you know, mm-hmm. and this you know this constant like uh, you know trying to one up the other dude to the other team or the other thing and trying to there, there, there ends up being a lot of uh, risky behavior and yeah. uh, and it can lead to a really kind of disordered thought process and decision making mm-hmm. process so you know just you just kind of covered like you went to a lot of places and did a lot of things and I am mm-hmm. not a podcast uh, you know I'm not a guy that hosts a podcast that's interested in listening to a bunch of war stories I th- those yeah. things are you know everybody's got those and I can't really relate to those maybe some people mm-hmm. can but what I what I want to hear about more is like when does this start to catch up with you because mm-hmm. I know every single time you know when people are faced with the things that you've already described, it's 99.9% of the time. I think there's a very small percentage of people that may somehow avoid this, but at some point it all catches up with you. And Mm -hmm. there's kind of a breaking point. And there's some things that happen that turn the tide where you're forced. You don't have a choice, Mm -hmm. really. You're forced to make it. Well, there are choices, Mm -hmm. but they're very, very extreme. And I kind of want to, I want to know like what, what was that point where you're like, I'm at, I'm at my limit and, and, how does that change your life? Okay. Yeah. And you know, honestly, this is the most I've talked. I haven't done a bunch of podcasts, but this is the most I've talked about my military experience. And I'll tie that in why here shortly, because um, I can't say what happened to me now is just because of the compounding effect of the deployment. I think it was just a compounding effect of at the time, 24 years of life, right? Childhood trauma that was the process, teenage, everything. All If it was a multiple choice, test we're answering all the above on this one um but mm-hmm. i came back from iraq in the Dece- december of 09 uh 2010 we went and did some work with the winter olympics so it was a real quick turnaround um didn't really process like nothing crazy happened over over there like just like you said we don't have to get into stuff there was nothing that i'm like oh shit like there were some situations but when you're over there and you're doing certain things you're kind of like well i finally get to do my job so that wasn't really like, okay, right? But I just like going from a place where when you leave the wire, or you leave your base or your fob or wherever you're at. And once you're gone, like there is the potential for people out there who want to kill you no matter what, just because you're not, you shouldn't be there to them. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it, it can shift the mentality. So going from that and then going right into, you know, working on the Olympics and just having this, I didn't have time to process. So I just drank. I just was drinking, right? Finished up that work, came back to Hawaii, running around to the bars, just being an idiot. 
um, running around with some friends of mine, ended up meeting a girl. We had a very bad relationship just right off the bat. Usually, like you said, that lifestyle can just lead to, lead to a lot of toxic stuff. Um, and that was kind of the breaking point for me because I noticed I started to slip. I was emotionally slipping on things and it was starting to scare me because I was afraid that what I was neglecting was going to end up leading to me hurting a teammate of mine or getting someone seriously hurt because in 2010, we had a teammate from another team in New York pass away on a training accident or he had a training accident during a training incident in Virginia. Um, so I was like that when that happened, it kind of shook home to us because we're a small community like, Oh shit. Like, like that, that's how real this is in training. You can die. Right. And that's like one of those things as a young guy, you don't think about it until it happens. So I'm like, oh, shoot. Mm -hmm. So I'm worried about what I'm doing because I'm being reckless. So I just went in on a whim one day and pulled both of my team leaders aside and said, I want out. I want out. I'm done. And they were like, why? What Like, what the hell are you talking about? Because I was, mm -hmm. like I said, never the best shooter, never the best communicator, never the best anything. But I was like the sixth man. Like, if this is a sports team, I'm winning the sixth man award. I'll, I'll clean up. I'll do whatever. I'm ready to work. Right. Let's, let's get it done. Let's roll the sleeves up and let's go. And that got me noticed because if you're that type of person, you will always be needed on a team. No one needs another prima donna. Hmm. They're always going to need a worker. Everyone hmm. needs a dog and I got a dog in me. So let's run, you know? And hmm. they were like, what, is, what the hell is going on? And I just was so emotionally shut down because like I said earlier, I didn't know how to process anything besides anger and aggression. I didn't have men around me to teach me how to do it. And then the men I looked up to were doing what I was doing, right? They weren't talking to their wives. They weren't. So like I had this terrible relationship where it's like verbally abusive, physically abusive, like, and same thing. I don't want to say anything bad about this person, but like I took my lumps. I need to take responsibility in that relationship. Also, I was not abusive, by the way. I just need to say that. Um, you know, but there were some times like she'd hit me in the face and do this and talk shit. And I would just like, like, how the, how is this my life? And then I'd go to work and I couldn't, I didn't feel right. connected with the boys anymore. So I was like, I, I can't, I'm done. So I just, I walked away from it. And then that was probably the worst decision I could have ever made at the time, because instead of just being a man and saying, I'm, I'm a mess right now, I need help. Someone help me. I left. Because I was like, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. And um, yeah, now I, what? They, I, now yeah, what? I felt like my team turned their back on me. So I felt alone. Um, and they didn't. They had a job to do. Right. So I can't sit there and say, oh, they like this story. I'm telling it all comes back to me. Right. And that was the catalyst to change. It all comes back to me. But at that time in my mind, I was like, they don't see me hurting. They don't see this. No one cares. Blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm so alone. Um. You know, so I spent like a year, like a year, maybe a little over a year, solo pity party working in the armory, still seeing the guys. I still got connections with them. We're good, but it's not the same. It's not the same anymore. You're not in the team room. Right. And I felt that. And I, mm -hmm. I didn't know how to express that. So I just bottled it up. Right. I didn't know what to do. So, you know, I kept with the bad vices. I still trained. I still worked out hard. I still tried to be valuable, but Jack Daniels was like my best friend. Okay. Um, Recently yeah. at the time, the best thing that came out of that bad relationship was I got saved. I am a Christian. Um, I was saved at the time. I said the sinner's prayer, had no idea what I was doing, but I was like, dude, I'm so lost that like, sure, you're saying this is going to help me. Okay. And like literally on my desk, I know this is silly, but I have a mustard seed on my desk because, you know, a mustard seed of faith is all it took to move a mountain in my life. So I got mm -hmm. saved, but I was still even saved thinking, oh, I'm a Christian now. I'm supposed to be this way. I'm supposed to be that way. Dude, I was showing up to church hungover, not proud of it, but like, I need to be here. I need to just be around something to change whatever like tornado was going on inside of me. Started praying, mm -hmm. didn't really know what I was praying for. Long story short, ended up meeting my wife, at, who wasn't my wife at the time, um, met her. I'm leaving in a month. I took orders because I panicked. I took orders instead of getting out of the Coast Guard. I took orders and just was like, okay, I'm going to go to Oregon. Um, went over to Oregon. Okay. Um, that's where it got dark because I, my, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, we decided to continue the relationship. I told her, like, I'm out of here in a month. If you don't, don't want to stay with me, I get it. Like, 
just, I got to throw it out there to you because you, you seem really cool. You're not the type of girl that I've been chasing around and I want to give you that respect. Um, and she's yep. such a G dude. You'll hear more about her in this story because my wife is a legitimate angel. Um, even saying that makes me want to cry because <laughs> there was a lot of time where no one was there for me, but her. So she has seen all of what I'm sharing now. She has seen the process of it. So whatever's coming, she deserves to be a part of all of it. So I need to share her part of this too. But she was just like, yeah, okay. Like you're leaving. So what? We got some time. Let's get to know each other. So we did. Our families thought we were crazy because after three months, we got engaged. After six months, we were married. So I got married to her in November. Okay. Yeah, man. Crazy, right? Oh, I, I left something out of this too, by the way. I'm sorry. Before I left, um, I have two suicide attempts. I know it's a lot, like what we're sharing, but I had one while I was in Hawaii where I spent the night in the bathroom battling a bottle of Jack Daniels and a pistol. And I would take glug, 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 pistol in my mouth, glug, 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 pistol in my mouth, and I couldn't pull the trigger. And I was so mad at myself because I was like, dude, oh my God. you are such a pussy that you can't even do this. And then three, four months later, I meet my girlfriend who becomes my wife. Okay, so, time, time out for a second. Yep, so, sorry. So, I know, so I can't believe I skipped over that, dude. I'm sorry. Let's let's go let's go back to this because obviously mm -hmm. that is not something that should be glossed no. over. Yeah. This is I assume I, I mean I'll ask the question. I mean, is this mm -hmm. is after you left the team, you're working in the armory yeah. and you're just kind yep. of struggling to kind of find out who you yep. are? Is there something that triggered this this moment where you were in the bathroom with the pistol in the in the bottle? Like mm -hmm. was it was it something that happened or was it just like kind of a build up? I, what can you a, what can you compound. tell us? Yeah. It was, it was definitely, okay. a, a, I think it was a compound. It was a, uh, it was a compound and not feeling like I was loved by my dad. It was a compound of, you know, multiple deployments and things around the world. It was that letting down my team and like that biggest fear now becoming a reality and now having that taken away from me. Um, my pride of feeling like people were talking about me when they really weren't because they had bigger things to deal with. And even if they were like, who cares? Um, and then like that bad relationship, okay. the bad drinking relationship. And it was just kind of like, I was at work one day and I'm sitting in the armory and I'm like, I didn't fucking go through everything to be here now. Like, fuck this. And I don't want to do this anymore. And I don't think it was looking at it now. I don't think I wanted to die. I wanted rest. And like anyone who's felt that way. I'm not talking about physical rest. I'm talking about like rest in my spirit, you know, like everything was just so heavy that I was like, I just can't at 20, 25, 24 years old. I was like, I just can't handle this. Like, I feel like I've, wow. I've done so much, been through so much already. Like if, if this is how much I've done in life already and the next is, it's just supposed to be more of this, like, fuck this, I'm out of here. I don't want to do this anymore. So it's so hard for me to relate to that, but at the same time, it's not the first or even tenth time I've, I've I've heard it, and I've had people sitting in the chair across from me, in this case on the screen, tell me very similar stories, and it's 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 hard for me, like I said, to kind of connect the dots on it. But uh, what I always come back mm. to is is I think I get the I think I can understand that it, just exhaustion or exasperation mm. of the things that are happening in life where you feel like you just keep continually maybe punched in the mouth and, yeah. and in the gut. And then once you're down there on the ground, kind of trying to recover from that, getting hit again and, and, and not being able to kind of see outside the, you know, and from the outside looking in like, well, how much of this is you, right? Mm -hmm. And how much of this is things that are outside of your control versus which, you know, how many things are inside your control. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it, for whatever reason, uh, you don't, you, you, you are not successful in, in any kind of a suicide attempt at that, at that point. Mm -hmm. what, what, how much after that, or at what point does, do things change where you start to, you said you met your now wife very mm -hmm. shortly after that. And then, yeah. and then there was this transition to Oregon, which was very shortly after you met, you, 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 mm -hmm. sorry, you met her. What type of a timeline are we talking about here? Oh, so I met her in May 
I moved in June. Um, we were wow. engaged in September, married in November. And I moved to, wow, so I think I spent a month in Massachusetts. So July I spent in Mass and then August I was in Oregon. Wow, this is so. This happens very, very fast. So can't imagine like you find somebody yeah. in your life, you you find somebody in your life that's supportive and it kind of understands mm-hmm. you after going through all of this stuff, right? Is somehow yeah. supporting and and staying committed. You know, like I know you're going to be gone for a while. I, mm-hmm. We really probably both of us don't know how this is going to end up. And yeah. then you go off, and now you're alone again to deal mm-hmm. and wrestle with all these things. I can't, man. That sounds like a tough. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a tough. Um, a tough road to hoe, if I'm being honest. Yeah, and I, I got to preface, I'm not, I'm not good at being alone. Like, I'm good at being alone when I need to recharge, right? But I'm not good at being alone. And I think a lot of us aren't. And that's something I'm willing to say now. But at the time, like, just like everything, I got this shit. I got it. I did right. not have it at all, right. right? So I get there, get to the new unit I'm at, still have those issues. And let's just start painting a metaphor here. Like I'm taking a beach ball, a metaphorical beach ball, and I'm still holding it underwater. So I show up to this unit and I got a stack on my chest and all this other stuff. And it's like, you know, okay, this dude's coming to do this, blah, 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 blah. So that fluffs my ego a little bit. I feel good. But then that hollowness starts coming back because of what I'm pushing down with that suicide attempt that I didn't talk about because I capped it up to being, oh, I was just drunk and upset and emotional. So anytime someone would try to talk about it, I would like, no, that, no, no, no. Like, you know, momentary lapse in judgment, folks, we all have them because like you said, in some of those communities, like sometimes, sometimes we can be a little reckless. I'll just put it that way. Right. So I just did that and tried to play that with a good poker face. And I brought a lot of those issues to Oregon. And I lived on, uh, I lived in Seaside. If anyone knows that area, it's a coastal community. In the winter, it is a no man's land. So I get to this unit. I'm the, I'm the only guy who's, I mean, there's guys who've done like ship deployments and all that, but I'm the only person who's been to Iraq. So I feel very disconnected right off the bat with that. Um, and I'm just not connecting. And then, like you said, I'm away from this person who to me at the time feels like a lighthouse, right? I'm in stormy weather, man. And my wife's like that beacon of light. So I'm just trying to find that light. Um, you know, because my wife's also a Christian, we're going to church together. I'm getting spiritually fed. Like I'm with a girl who's making me want to be a better man and like not go out and not do this stuff. And like, I've always been a good guy. Like I wasn't an asshole, you know, but I like to go out. I like to have fun. And now it's like, go to church sure. on Sunday. Like, you know what I mean? It was just like right. someone wanted, someone I wanted to be better for. But that, that, that pull of that enemy man or like whatever I had inside of me was still like those roots were really, really deep. And I had another attempt. And I had someone hmm. at the time who I was same thing, so mad at because they, they brought it up to the doc or the corpsman. Um, and they took me to... Okay. They took me and they told that the corpsman said, hey, bro, I think you just need to get out of here. Like, you, let me take you out to lunch. Let's just go to lunch. Okay. I'll buy you lunch. Let's just, so I go with them and I'm like on edge, bro. Like, I don't want to talk to anyone. I'm super punchy. Like, and this dude like gets me to get my guard down. And now looking back and like working in this field, I see what he did, but he got my guard down enough and took me for a ride and brought me to Madigan Hospital, which if anyone's familiar, that's the Army Hospital up in Washington, and okay. put me in a position where I was forced to self-admit into a psychiatric hospital because I was there at one o'clock in the morning. We went and drove around and he's like, hey, brother, I'm just going to kill time because like, what, are we going to go back to the ship? I'm just going to kill time and you can just talk or we can just listen to music and do whatever. So I'm like chilling out in the car and then like slowly start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. But at that point, I'm so like emotionally and mentally defeated that I just accepted it. I was like, fuck. Mm. Okay. So I get up into the hospital. I'm there at one o'clock in the morning. I only meet the, the people who do the intakes, but they take everything from me because they make you see right there, suicide attempts, suicidal ideation, and they like put it in your face. So that first night, I have someone coming in my room every 15 minutes. I got all my stuff taken away from me. Like no pens, no sharp objects, no nothing. So I don't sleep at all. And I'm like in the room doing push-ups. Like right away, I get into like prison mentality because I don't know where I'm at. I got people coming in my room. I don't know who's there. 
it's a, a, a medical clinical setting, but it's very clearly not like a set up like a hospital. Like when you have straps yeah. on beds and things like that, it's just really different. So it shifted my mind a little. Sounds so I'm scary. like doing push-ups in the room and they're telling me to like calm down in there. And I'm like telling the staff to like go fuck themselves. And like, just, wow. just because it's like, I felt like an animal, right? Like put an animal in a corner and you're going to see a couple things. Like, and even a little chihuahua, you put a chihuahua in the corner, it may piss itself, but it'll still show you its teeth. Right. Sure. You know? So like, I'm in the corner, I'm like there, but I'm still trying to protect whatever pride and ego I still have attached to this. Like, I'm an operator still. I did these things. Like, this isn't me. And I still used it as a way to not face my reality. Um, so I wake up the next morning in the hospital um, and I go and I meet everyone at breakfast and they force me to stand up and introduce myself to everyone. And, okay. oh, dude, I just stood up and said my name and just started crying and i was like i don't know what i'm doing here and like all this stuff just started finally coming out and it was like right uh, like and no one said anything but they all got up and just gave me a hug just and like dude i needed that so bad oh my god like you know I saw. I, I hear this analogy. I hear the. I hear okay. this analogy. It's. It's the. And I've used it before too. And that is the. You know. <laughs> there's a couple ways. One is stuffing ten pounds of shit into a five pound box. Yeah. Right. And what ends up happening ultimately when that, when that, that thing overflows because it's kind of, mm-hmm. uh, or it's the rocks in the backpack or the rucksack, yep. and you just keep depositing these rocks into that, and that being the traumas and the challenges and the I'm not good enough and all the things, the failures, they start going to this backpack. And, you know, again, you're, you're coming from a, from a population and you're working in, a, in an environment where you just keep going. You're not, you, you don't give up. Like you're not allowed to give up. It's not acceptable yeah. to give up. And it just makes sense that I would be hurting with all this stuff because that's what we do. And ultimately that backpack breaks or the box overflows and, you know, it manifests into all kinds of different things. Yeah. Um, and this, this, this you, 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 when, when you're walking into these situations where finally someone at least acknowledges that they understand mm-hmm. how you're feeling or what you're going through, and uh, they don't even have to say anything. They don't yeah. have to say anything is, is uh, you know, I've had my own experiences, but, um, you know, this, you know, folks from, from the communities that you come from, I think that's the bigger thing is when they, when they get there, there's a couple things that happen. One is that they realize that, wow, they're, they're not alone. Like there's a lot mm-hmm. of other people that have this very similar stuff that has done the same thing. And, and that's met with like, initially I, you know, and you could, I'm sure you can speak to this, but it's met with like, oh my gosh, like this feels good to understand that people, mm-hmm. other people understand me. But then there's this other part where it's like, why the fuck have we taken, why is it taking this long for this to come out? Why wasn't anybody yeah. else saying anything? Why mm-hmm. did I have to suffer? Why didn't anybody else come forward and, and say like they were feeling the same thing? Cause we could have maybe avoided all of this stuff. Right. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. And honestly, I think that that's something that's a daily practice for me still, because if I'm being honest, I still have pride. And anytime pride gets in the way, right. it stops me from sharing the message or speaking out about it. And when I look back at a lot of these things where I was blaming others, when I look back at the lenses I have now, it was my pride and my ego that stopped the action on my end that could have stopped all of this. That, you know, now seeing it, I see it all for the bigger picture. But like I said, like, it was easy for me at the time to say, why did it take me having to, you know, almost kill myself for someone to realize that I was hurting? If these people knew me so well, why didn't they realize that something was different than with me? And the way I ask myself right. that now is, well, then why didn't you say anything? If you felt that close to them, why didn't you say anything? And I'm like, yeah, right. Cause I street. have to take ownership for myself. Right. I, I can't. And, and one of the biggest things I learned through that process, cause that, that hug or those hugs, I should say, cause it was several, it was a, it was yep. a big old man meat party, which like I said, I needed it, dude. Like, and I felt a hundred pounds lighter afterwards, honestly. And that was just like the tip of a much larger iceberg of things for me to unpack, but it started to let me know that I could let my guard down and that it was okay to be vulnerable. But now it was time to learn how to turn vulnerability into strength because 
I was not comfortable being vulnerable because I came from a very macho environment. And then let's go back to my grandfather real quick. My grandfather survived the Holocaust as a little boy. What what suffering do I have? That You know what I mean? But then I started to realize yeah. there is no trauma Olympics, right? There's really no trauma Olympics. So yeah. even my stories that trigger certain trauma for me may be different than other people's, but we all know what it's like to be sad, depressed, at our wits end, happy, excited, lukewarm. We all know what those feelings are. So why are we not talking about just feeling those things, right? And that was my issue. I didn't talk about what I was feeling. I just talked about what I could dominate. Yeah, that's so, it, it is interesting. And, and again, this is a very familiar conversation to me. You know, my friend Greg from, Greg Grogan from the Overwatch Collective talks about this. And we've talked about it before. And that is the comparison of traumas and that mm-hmm. stacking up and the like, oh, my trauma, you just mentioned your grandfather. I cannot imagine, that, mm-hmm. not even fathom the the amount of stuff that that man went through as a mm-hmm. as a young boy in his formable years being in a situation like that. Um, mm-hmm. that I don't think there's any way to do it. And so I'm sitting here on my end, right, thinking that. And so anytime I'm having a bad day, like I could very easily reconcile that against, well, fuck, dude, like anything you're going mm-hmm. through today is and pales in comparison to anything this guy went through. Right, mm-hmm. and I think that comparison of trauma going well, dude. My, my, I don't have enough trauma to really even, right, really even complain compared to what this other guy has been through on this deployment mm-hmm. or in this situation at, at, at work as a law enforcement officer. Or, you know, this person's upbringing and childhood traumas, you know, and all the things that that are gone along along mm-hmm. or, or have come along the way. That's that is, I think, a huge danger for for men. Particularly mm-hmm. in their in their comparison, and they're pushing the shit down into the box or into right. the rucksack till all this comes up. So when I hear you say, you know, talk about the way you're, you're in, in in the way that you're talking about it right now, I get it. But I also want to just acknowledge that that I think this is a th- this is a problem. This is it's mm-hmm. a big problem. Like you 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 use the term um, trauma Olympics. Like there's no mm-hmm. fucking competition here. Right. Like there. Nobody wins at this game ever. Mm-hmm. It only ever there's only ever losers in it in the end until you make until you own it, until you make a decision to change it. And I I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but that's just what I keep getting from guys like you yeah. all the time in, in in terms of their journey. And there, there's this finally this call to, dude. I I get it. Like I there, there's been some messed up stuff here, but. This is not bigger than me. This is not the yeah. fine who I am. I can, mm-hmm. I can handle this. I just need to find. I need some tools and some skills to be able to handle it and and refocus it or redirect yeah. this energy. So I think the question in all this is like, what do you do to redirect this energy? How does this How does this turn out mm-hmm. for you? So after being uh, discharged from the hospital, I was discharged from active duty six weeks later. No medical follow-up, no nothing, just kind of like, hey, this guy's a problem, get him out of here. Um, my original home wow. record is Massachusetts, so I called my parents and shipped all my household goods that I had back to them and said, I, I'm moving back to Hawaii with my bride. And I had a few thousand dollars and my wife, and I called her from the hospital. She didn't even know what was going on. I called her from the hospital. Take, take this for, this says everything you need to know about my wife. We were married for a month. I called her from the hospital and said, hey, I am in a psychiatric hospital. I don't know when I'm getting out, and I'm pretty sure my career is over. And she literally just said, it's okay. We'll figure it out. Come home. Wow. Right? And at the time, I'm like, figure it out? If I knew that, I wouldn't be here. You know what I mean? But like, I was still thinking so, like, this is the thing. And, you know, I had to realize, too, like, to become... I don't really talk a ton about my military stuff. I share it because I work in the tactical community. But the thing I'm most proud of of my service is that did not kill me. Going into the hospital didn't kill me. It broke me to my core. It made me realize that to become the person that I needed to become, I needed to lose everything that I thought I was. I thought I was an operator. I thought I was a badass. I thought I was this. I thought I was that. Hey, I showed my hand and chances are I wasn't. I had all the attributes to do that job and I had time to serve in that community and that was great, but it wasn't for me. My real lesson in active duty was surviving that. And then also being able to get discharged from the military and pick up the pieces and create 
a career where it didn't break me. I didn't become a statistic, but I've used my trauma to help other people. And that's what I'm most proud of. Yeah. And that's the thing that I want to transition to because this turns into a success story, obviously, Mm -hmm. or we wouldn't be talking today. You wouldn't even be here. Um, and again, people never become successful all by themselves. You've mentioned, mm-hmm. you know, the work that you put in yourself, but also the, you know, the the support that you had from your from your mm-hmm. wife. And and I know there's a greater community that comes along with this, whether they probably even know that or not. They're supporting you on a daily basis. But we'll get to that. Yeah. But let's mm-hmm. talk about like that 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 transition out of there, that refocus, that reframing of what you you had, and the the quote unquote figuring it out. What For happens? Sure. Like so this this kind of this kind of takes you into this whole other journey <laughs> of this is who I was, or at least I thought I was. Yeah. Like, but reality is is this, I've been this other guy the whole time. I was just kind of I could put that guy in the closet somehow and mm-hmm. now I gotta go discover who he is and bring him out. Like so what what do you find out in this journey, man? What do, what do you do? Oh man, I realized I was way more prideful than I thought because I wouldn't even talk about like I was this or I was that thing because I was still so shameful of being in the hospital and being discharged and all of these other things. Um, so where preparation meets opportunity, I'm like, well, shoot, I don't have a job. What am I going to do? My wife went to a CrossFit gym at the time. So I started coaching, uh, starting strength over there while I went to college. Um, I used my okay. GI bill. Um, so I was like, well, <laughs> I wanted to use the GI Bill. I guess we're not going to be a cop anymore considering what happened. So let's figure out what's going on with our brain. Um, So I went to school for human services, which is kind of just an umbrella term for social work. Um, And it kind of just like opens up the silo, right? And for that, it was for me, it was much more like veteran veteran service organization work. Um, So I went to school, working my way through school, working as a strength coach, because it's something I've been passionate about. And I'm building that skill, learning how to communicate still. Um, and I have an outlet to, to put some of the stuff I'm still trying to process inside. Um, because at this point, I'm still not fully open to what I needed to do to heal um, or go on the healing process because it's never yep. really over. Yep. Um, yep. But I'm going to school. I'm fired up because I got a little bit of a purpose. And like I said, I just need a, I've always just needed a little carrot to keep going. Um, go to school. My wife's okay. a hard charger. She's like, listen, homie, you're going to school. But if you're getting like, if you're not getting all A's, you're not working as a part-time strength coach either. Got it. So I'm like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> all of a sudden I go from like the worst student ever to, you know, a, a good student. I, I graduated with my undergrad with a 3.8, which I'm proud of because I failed out of college. So I'm like, oh, shoot, I can do this too. Like, so I'm in the military. I get this job where it's hard for me and I can do it. And then it leads to all this other stuff. And then I go back to school and I realize I can be successful in that too. So I'm like, well, shoot, okay, what's the skill set that's helping me here? Showing up, being consistent, doing the work, right? Putting, putting plans and agendas together and all of these things, but just take, keeping it real basic. Right. Go to school, read the assignment, do the homework, pass it in on time. Simple. Right. <laughs> Show up 15 minutes before or 30 minutes before the class, set out the barrels, write out the workout, make sure everything's good to go. Right. Make sure you have your progressions and regressions. You're there for the class. It's about them, not you. Ready, go. All right. Then the other yep. coaches there <laughs> see the effort. They give you teach back. They help you out. Right. So it's like, oh, okay. Like, I guess the skills that I need, it's not really talent. I just need to show up and put in effort and have a good attitude. So I started to realize the thing that was separating me even in the military um, was my effort and attitude I brought towards things. Because even in the hospital, when I got out of the hospital, the thing that helped me was my effort and attitude towards attacking the problem instead of being a victim towards it. Now, I had my moments Mm. where I was like, poor me, feel bad for me. I hate the world. I hate this. I hate that. But like I said, when we boil it down, all those fingers came back to me. So I have to take responsibility. Um, But without going off topic, so I go, I graduate in 2015. I'm stoked. Veteran, college degree, what more could you want? Step into the workforce. I take my first job working with homeless veterans, pretty much doing your analysis testing for $10 an hour as a 27 or God at the time, a 20, 28 year old man. So hold on, depressed, time out. So depressing. where is this? This is yeah. a, this is, is this at the VA or is this in some no, like this is third a, party I program? What is this? Nonprofit. 
Uh, I worked in the veteran nonprofit Got sector. It. I always, I always gravitated towards the nonprofit um, just because the softy in me, right? Like it just made me feel like Got it was it. more meaningful yep. work. The people who were there wanted to be there. Um, but yeah, the pay wasn't great. I took a job for $10 an hour. So same thing. God humbled me. Where's your pride, dude? $10 an hour. Do you really want to help veterans? Let's find out. Shoot. Wow. So, so I took the job. What, and so, so you mentioned it's, it's your analysis testing. Like these guys are probably in a really tough spot. So I was like a day supervisor pretty much for a hundred man transitional homeless shelter that were guys coming off of the streets or in prison wow. or a combination of the two. So it's pretty much like a, a gigantic halfway house. You got guys doing drugs. You got guys getting in fights. You got guys threatening to stab each other. Like, so it's just a very, and then you got, you realize with the veteran community, a lot of it is dual diagnosis because you have mental health disorders. And then you also have people who are using and abusing substance to self-medicate. Is this, a, this is in Hawaii? This is in Hawaii. Yeah. So I moved back this, to Hawaii in so, 2012 and stayed. Okay. So the reason I ask this is, I mean, you're talking about an island, right? And the population, yeah. when you start looking at the rest of the states in the United States, is not massive, right? So you, right. you mentioned like there's 100 people here in this facility that have come back to or been transitioned out of the military and are now in this situation. They're coming out of prison. They're coming out of jail. Mm -hmm. They're coming out of a really, really, really rough spot. And it's a highly concentrated, very, um, well, it's a, it's a concentrated population in a very small, small area. I'm sure everybody knows mm -hmm. one another. Um, every it, you know, everybody knows one another. Everybody's been through the same things together. Like it, it's the the points of separation there have got to be pretty, pretty, pretty tight. Um, yeah. And th so this 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 experience of working with these guys is it helping you, or are you just be are you just like I got to get out of this? Like where are you in this whole thing? Uh, I I I looked at it as the ticket to the dance. And now it was up to me to prove that I could dance. Um, so I just took the yeah, job it. because it was like, I needed an opportunity and it was like, yeah, the money's not great, but yeah. these guys need help. I'm a veteran. I'm hurting. So selfishly, it'll probably help me to be around them. Um, it will also keep me in a position where like, Hey, these guys are way worse off than you. You come here and work and then go home to your wife. So you still got stuff to bitch about, but these guys are sleeping four dudes to a room. Like it's prison right? Like protecting their food right. and everything. So it's like, it put a lot of perspective for me. So anytime that I would feel that like pity party, I would just have to literally observe my environment and be like, all right, dude, you got work to do. Like there's people who you did, have to help. Did you feel like you were really making a difference or was this just, we have an awful situation here and we're just trying to manage it? I felt like if I could, on the, on the 30,000 Put perspective, I don't feel like I was making a, a difference because it was a revolving door. Right. But when it came to building and learning how to communicate and build honest relationships and get people to open up, I know I made a difference. I know I did, hands down. Got it. So, um, yeah, you got to practice the craft, person, right? Yeah. And it's, it, and it, it, it made me start to learn how to, well, if I'm going to ask you to share, I need to share. And that was also for me like that yeah. metaphorical punch in the mouth because I didn't want to share especially as the professional, right? Because we're supposed to have it together. So I looked at transparency as weakness, but what God was doing in my life was building transparency into strength, right? Because if I can stand here and share my stuff with you, share my te tears, share my emotion and do it unashamed looking like this, then I literally give permission to everyone else to do the same thing because it's not expected to come from someone right. like me. Yeah, I think that's a, I mean, that that right there is super powerful because I and, and I think that a lot of folks that have the ability and somewhere internally and they may not understand it or not they really want to help people do this but that is the thing that they have mm -hmm. to get over first whether it's the veteran community law enforcement community you know civilian community what, what yeah. whatever it is that is the thing is that being okay and being right with what you just said um, mm -hmm. well let's talk about like so you you. How long do you do this before there's a realization that you feel like you need to do more and you can do more? So I worked in the veteran community for a while. I actually worked my way up into a career development position where I worked with post 9-11 veterans, helping them get jobs. So same thing, perfecting the craft of networking and building and all of these skills that at the time, I'm like, how is this going to apply? 
Well, when I decided yep. I didn't want to do that anymore and I was sick of being a part-time participant in the fitness industry because I just didn't like what I was seeing. Uh, and instead of complaining yep. about it, I decided to throw my name in, in there. And um, yeah, dude, I was I, I came home one day. I worked through COVID. And through COVID, I, I ended up working for a much larger nonprofit. I had a great job. I had a great team. I had a really good thing set up for me. I could have stayed there and honestly worked there the rest of my life. Um, but I didn't feel satisfied in my soul about the type of work I was doing. I knew as, as, as comfortable as I was financially and everything else, I knew that I was supposed to be doing something bigger. So when I made, I came home, I talked to my wife and my wife was like, my wife and my family pretty much were like, it's about time. Like we were just waiting for you to be ready for this. Um, because I've always been, I touched a barbell at 13 years old and that was my first love. And I will love it until the day that I die. I mean, it's, I it, it was the, it was, it's, it's just, I can't explain it. If you know, you know, right. And um, I know, so that I gave know. me confidence. <laughs> Yeah. And that gave me confidence hearing the people that I love and care about tell me like, yeah, you should do this because I've also dealt with a lot of imposter syndrome. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. Uh, are you sure? Look what happened to all these other things. Like you got a good thing going on. So I finally make the leap. I talk to my bosses and my bosses are like, what are you doing? Like, this is not a, like the fitness industry, especially now through COVID is not a lucrative industry. Like it's not I know a career you personally. Yeah. yeah. You battled a lot through it. So I'm like, well, I don't Tons. care. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to figure it out because I believe in myself. And and one thing I want to tell anyone out here before we get into this whole building, if you don't believe in yourself, why should anyone else? Simple as that. So I had all these people Fair telling enough. me, you're, you're an idiot pretty much. And I had one supervisor who said, dude, push your chips and go all in. Like, I've seen what you can do. Like, everything you do, you're solid. So why would this be any different? You just got to be okay with starting over. And right back to my point of reference of starting over with the way I got out of the military, I'm like, well, that didn't kill me. So I'm sure I yeah. can figure this part out, right? A little bit of ego there too, because you as you know, just as well as I do, the fitness industry, especially when we're talking big box, is an absolute meat grinder. Yeah, so but it's, in, look, the ego, is, it, the ego is helpful. I mean, I, yes, I don't know is. anybody that's been ultimately ultimately successful in this business that doesn't have a little bit of that it's it can yeah. be very healthy it's just how you utilize it yeah yeah and i realize too my ego now is just more about my confidence and the ability to adapt yeah. if i don't learn the right way the first time right so i'm sure right. just like you we even view failure totally different which is why we do what we do which is i'm glad most people don't or we wouldn't have a job right but correct <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's just one of those things, man. It was like I started getting the certs, and even with the certs, you get them because it builds a baseline of credibility, but it doesn't mean you know anything because it's equal part science and practical application. And then the art of coaching comes with the ability to connect with others. I got that through my eight years of veteran service work, right? So I get the yeah, you're a pro. You're cert. a pro at that already. Yeah. So you, you, you it, have you have mastered that much. at some level. <laughs> yeah. Well. well call it what you want, but I mean, you're talking about talking with some of the hardest people to yeah. communicate with that are the, the, the least receptive, uh, the most pushback, all of those things. I mean, those are things that a lot of new coaches or a lot of new people wa yeah. wa walking into this industry, they're only learning for the first time. And, yeah. you know, they've got all this, as you mentioned, certifications, education, whatever else. But at the end of the day, really, what it really comes down to is being able to connect with the human and communicate with them. Yeah, uh, you know that that other stuff is important. It is very important. Mm -hmm. You have to know what the hell you're talking about. Definitely, you know when it comes down to the application of. But but at the same time, like I don't care, you know how much you know, how much education you have. If you can't get somebody to listen to you, and mm -hmm. or if you can't listen to somebody else tell you what they need and want, and then yeah. be able to communicate that back to them and put together a, a thing that works for them, you're worthless both to yourself mm -hmm. and to them. So. Yeah. yeah, at this point you're coming in like with a ma like a PhD in comms, right? With the most difficult mm -hmm. population. Well, and then it started to make me realize too, like you said, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. So like if you yeah. can get that, yeah. right? Cuz that to, that was like I didn't even realize at the time because I'm like I need to get these certs, my bachelor's degrees in, you know, human services and I got a personal training cert, like this isn't enough. <laughs> So I got, I went to, um, I went to Georgia Southern university and went through a postgraduate certificate program in strength and conditioning to get that formal, you know, two semesters of graduate level right. education to prep for the CSCS. And then I went and I took the test. 
I failed it the first time by two questions because I rushed, right? I rushed. I was confident. Not uncommon. I looked at everything. Yeah. And I finished with 25 minutes left where now looking back, I'm like, you idiot. But that's what I needed because when I went back the second time, I was confident because I was more prepared for what was to come. I had seen the test. I knew what to expect, but I also knew that what to expect was not what I saw last time. So I better know my stuff. Right. And it just made me refine a little bit more right. and put into practice what I was learning. Um, so I went and like you said, the, the education part is super important. So I don't want to downplay that. Um, so that's the route I went to get back up to speed on the education side. But then I've always used that communication to my advantage. I love talking to people. I love connecting with people. I love meeting people and just being like, how can, how can what I do help you? Right. Like I don't, I'm not really doing right. this. I'm going to work out. I'm going to eat right. I'm going to write. I'm going to manage my stress. But if these are things that you deal with and struggle with, then how can I help you navigate that? So where does this go? Because like, I think I mentioned at the top of the hour or at the top of the podcast that you, you, you're doing this on several different levels now, yeah. uh, which doesn't, I, I don't think should surprise anybody listening at this point, uh, which is why I wanted to kind of put all the stuff out there in front. Talk about like, there's a transition. So again, there was the CrossFit thing. You were coaching sort of part-time mm -hmm. and you're going to school full-time you get your you get your papers for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. uh, and you get some more experience. And then you know there's a there's some opportunities that probably come up here. How do you mm -hmm. get to where you are now, where you're working with the Marine Corps as well as your own business? Because this is this is uncommon. I do know mm -hmm. a couple of very successful, uh, very well respected cats out there that are doing what you're doing in other branches, but. Uh, I, I, I really want to hear this story and I'm, I'm sure other people are curious about it too. Okay. So as you guys can kind of tell, I'm sure by now, and even with you, like I have a very non-traditional path to the things that I'm doing now. And that's just like with fitness, that's kind of part of the process is you just got to learn how to ride the waves of the journey and like where it brings you. Right. And using the things from previous cycles or whatever you're doing to create and to continue to build and then leave what's not applying anymore. So I started my business in 2015 because I was working as a strength coach in CrossFit gyms, but it was a way for me to separate from just CrossFit because I was also competing in powerlifting. Um, so, you know, have a love affair with the barbell, always will understand the importance of strength and conditioning and all this. But if you really want to get me going, let's talk squat bench and deadlift. So I'm teaching okay, all that gotcha. stuff. I'm going, <laughs> I'm competing. I'm, I'm not a great lifter, but I show up and I, I had the opportunity to compete at a national level and it was awesome. Um, but really it wasn't, it was starting to become less about me and more the impact I was having on other people. And that's why I started my business because I wanted to coach other lifters, but then I still had all this yep. stuff from the military. So it was like, well, I also want to train tactical athletes. But at the time when I was competing okay. in powerlifting and dealing with stuff, I became a big old, big old beefcake. And I'm like, ain't nobody going to listen right. to me about running and gunning being 240 pounds. Right. So I had to lose yeah, weight. Gotcha. <laughs> right. So I lose weight, get back in shape. And as that's happening, it's kind of transitioning and molding my business into these different things. Um, and for years, it just kind of sat. I was like the business owner, but it was like a hibernating business. And when opportunities would pop up, I'd jump at them like... Um, I've had the opportunity to work okay. with 5.11 and be like one of their always be ready academy instructors. So like things like that would pop up and I would jump at it, but I wasn't like actively pursuing clientele the way that I was a few years ago to now where I just kind of don't have to do that same grind. So I had the business, but it was yep. kind of stagnant for a little while. Um, started doing work with like uh, Honolulu Police Department, some of their SSD guys, the canine guys and EOD. And it was a lot of kettlebell work, but it was more non-traditional stuff based off of, hey, no matter what, whether you're LEO, first responder, or military, I know for a fact you have miles on your back, your knees, and your hips. And these are the things that are going to come from that. And these are the ways that if you're training these ways, it's going to add more miles unnecessarily and cause these issues down the line. So let me teach you how to fix it. So I started finding, okay, what's the problem? Like, what is the problem out here? What is the hole in the community? Oh, there's no one in the tactical space in Hawaii. Got it. Okay. What's something that every tactical mm. community deals with? Because I don't want to just go with the military because I still kind of have that bad divorce, it feels like. Right. And I still have a law enforcement okay. background too. 
So I'm like, okay, how do I merge all this stuff together? Well, skeletal muscular injuries, all of us deal with it. All of us act like tough guys. All of us are taught to just push through it. And then anyone towards the end of their career is wearing their injuries like a badge of honor. To me, that's dumb, right? I always looked up to the guys who could continue to move, not the guys who were like, oh, back in my day, I did this. But now that I'm, you know, I'm this way, I can't do that anymore. You'll see one day. Because to me, that's just a testament to shitty Talking training about, and shitty programming. Uh, look, dude, I am that guy. Like for a long time, like it was like, this is what I used to be able to do. And that's what I would talk mm-hmm. about for a long time. Like this is dumb. And I had to completely ch- switch my mindset, and my way of training, which was really hard to do because I was always really fucking strong in the weight room, right? You talk mm-hmm. about the bench dead squat, like I- I'm there all day long that yeah. I recognize like oh, doing that all the time is probably not a good idea. And right. it's gotten me to the point where I am, where I can't do lots of other things. That's like a, that's a huge shift that people have to go through. But I also get like, there's you, people relate to it. Like they go, Oh, well this mm-hmm. is fitness. Cause I can deadlift more than this guy, or I can bench more than that right. guy or, or whatever else in that going back to the ego piece and the military LEO first responder piece. Like these are benchmarks for whatever mm-hmm. reason end up showing up and at the end of the day like the at the end of the day no selection process no mission you were ever going to run whatever and again i'm not trying to talk out of turn here but i i think i'm i'm pretty confident saying this nobody none of that shit means like you're you're Mm -hmm. one rep max on a bench press or a squat or deadlift as zero to fucking fucking do with any of that right there's other ways so you gotta let that go that strength yeah (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Right. hundred percent. It is. It's, it's, it's one of those things where it's tough because in those communities, right? Like, like you said, we want to do things the way that we do and everything can turn into a competition. Right. right? And that's Almost always just does. the way it is. So when I, when I was able to come into a room and say, Hey, I, i I am one of you in the context of, I have this sort of background that may not be the same, right. But it's somewhat similar in some varying degrees. These are the things that I've dealt with. These are the things that, the, you know, I can bring to the table to help alleviate you with your symptoms. So I found a problem and created a solution to a problem, not by creating, like inventing the wheel on my own. The information's out there. There's so many good coaches that I look up to that even with my work, I just hope that I do justice to the people I look up to in the industry, right? That's yep. really what matters to me. So it's like, even with that, the responsibility now of training Marines and all these other things, like my stuff better be correct because if these dudes are overtrained or something isn't right, it shows up to them, not by a loss on their column. Something bad happens, someone dies or they die. Right. So Mm -hmm. I take my job with them very, I take that as a high responsibility, but to kind of backtrack a little bit, I started this whole process with my own business and had it sit. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like humble pie. I have no idea what I'm doing. So I need to learn how to sell fitness in the, as a business. I love to train people, but I'll train people for free. So I'm not going to be able to eat that. Um, so I went to a big box yeah. gym and I learned, the se- I learned the art of selling and I learned the art of selling fitness and uh, what that whole thing was in portrayed. And the biggest thing I learned that it wasn't for me. And that's great because I needed yep. to experience that type of environment to realize that I was meant for something better than that. And it's not that that was better or worse, but for me, I just knew that there was something more I could be doing. Um, so. I was always looking for jobs and opportunities. I kept my stuff active. I, I kept holding, you know, semi-annual workshops with whatever branch of the military would take me out here and I would do them pro bono to just network. Hey, I, I'll come out and I'll teach you a day-long workshop for a t-shirt and a coin as long as I can get in front okay. of the soldiers. And I did that for years. Free work, free work, free work. And on the weekends, it would be me and my wife and I would be the one teaching and she would be the one taking pictures so we could you know, put it up and say we were doing these things. And it was just kind of like a two man duo. And, um, I went to a big box gym to learn the more personal training side of the house, kept my resume up to date. Cause I have this great resume as a veteran service organization, mental health provider, but I don't have much to say as a fitness professional. So I start to understand that I'm playing chess, not checkers. So I need to build that out. So I build out the tactical yeah. side with my business and I build out the fitness side with the big box. I merge them together, create a resume, and then dumb luck and preparation pops up. I'm on USA Jobs one day. I see a job for the Marine Corps pop up. So I have a friend who works over there and help promotion, shoot her a message. 
And she's like, yeah, it's a great job, but the only downfall is it's entry level. So it's base bottom pay. You're not going to be doing what you're qualified to do and you're way overqualified for the position. Are you going to be okay with that? She said, whatever, whatever's going to get me in the door because whatever's better than what I'm doing now because right now I'm walking into a gym that sounds like a club at three o'clock in the morning and I hate it. I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, I gotcha. And I don't like selling and done that. So yeah, and I'm like, whatever. Like, so another thing a humble pie i take this job and it's a whopping 14 dollars an hour and as a business owner and all these other things i'm like dude i can't live off of this so it's more incentive to work harder and grind harder so i'm like well that's not going to be that number for very long so i get there and within a year of being there i you know get established and all this i'm able to you know double however much money i'm making and things end up working out in the time but imagine if i use that as a barrier of entry I love fitness. I love working with Marines, but I can't do that. $14 an hour. Well, then how much do you love it? Because I didn't get into this industry to get rich. I got into this industry to make a difference. And if I'm going to help anyone, I'd rather help Marines because when you think Marine, what do you think? Right? I don't even have to say it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, they're they're already fit, right? They got it all together and they're first in and these guys are the toughest guys and and the most fit guys on the planet and whatever else. But I understand what the underbelly of that ends up looking like at the end of the day. Yeah. There are oftentimes they're they get the worst gear, like they have yep. the least amount of sp- uh, money spent on them. They have the least amount of resources, yet they're expected to do, you know, all of these yep. things with very very little. That's what I also yep. know about them. So, you know, I, I think I get where you're going with this. Yeah, and hung, you know what? Hungry dogs run faster. That's all I'll say about Marines and that's why yeah, I love them. Yeah, man. That's why I love them. And you know what too, like so sitting where I am now, because it's been a few years since that whole story, I'm the, the lead strength and conditioning coach on Marine Corps Base Hawaii. I have a team underneath me. We're able to integrate in completely with the units that we work with and do everything from assess to program for the individual's weaknesses all the way up to whatever the whole battalion or company may need. Um, we're able to come in and teach injury prevention and resiliency workshops. We have it set up where we're in the NCO academies now. So when these guys are becoming non-commissioned officers, we're teaching them no-nonsense wow. fitness and resiliency and actually teaching them to look at themselves like athletes instead of just getting in the gym and meatheading it out. Um, the importance of sleep, resiliency, stress management with my whole story, that's what you know comes into play. Um, my work on the veteran yep. side of the house too. Now I'm in a position where I can talk to these guys and say, hey, I was one of you. This happened to me. I spent all this time working with guys like us who got out and went this other way and now have all these other physical ailments and issues they work with. Let me teach you how to process with your brain. Let me teach you how to move your body the right way so you're not in pain. And let's start looking at this whole thing as a whole body process because performance, physical and mental performance is a four-part series. And just like I'm sitting on a chair right now, I got four legs on my chair. Right? I need all four legs to be equally balanced for me to be stable and sit here. If one of those legs is cut even an inch, I'm completely off. So when I'm looking at my tactical athletes now, I'm looking at physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. All those legs of the chair need to be addressed and utilized because if one is off, that chair starts to go. And over time, like you said, we, part, we put rocks in that rucksack. Next thing you know, you're on the floor. I, I think so. I think the pillars that you're meant you're talking about right now are mm-hmm. starting to be more well accepted. Yeah. And but at the same time, uh, it took a long time to get there, and I still think it's mm-hmm. it's a semi unpopular message. Uh, Very much again, so. you mentioned like the meat. Yeah, you, you you mentioned the meathead approach, right? The meathead approach works until it doesn't, and that is a fact. Yeah. It works until it doesn't, and eventually, it's not gonna. Yeah. And whatever it is that catches up with you. And it's it's going to be one of those four pillars that's going to wind up mm-hmm. that's going to wind up catching up with you. If one mm-hmm. of those pillars goes down. That meat hut approach will uh, almost all the time sort of you'll, you'll use that as the overcompensation, which yeah. then ends up taking away from all those other things in the end. And then before you're you're faced with, well, let's be honest. I mean, you're kind of faced with the things that you ended up getting faced with maybe at some point. Um, yeah, you know, depending on which one of those pillars is suffering the most. Um, it, so uh, it's, it's encouraging to hear that there's investment being put into, uh, the soldiers of today to, to think about them as the athlete and mm-hmm. the, 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 
the important thing to understand there is, is like, you know, you can look at it. I think you have to look at it in, in a different way and that, you know, Matt, most athletes that have any type of resource put it into them. And, and I think actually maybe I, maybe, maybe it was you that said this. It's about the concept of winning and the difference mm-hmm. between winning, let's just say, as like a collegiate athlete or a professional football player, baseball player, golfer or whatever else. Like you, the goal is to win because, and it's partly entertainment, but it partly aligns pocketbooks right mm-hmm. at the end of the day versus the tactical athlete. And I, sometimes I have a little bit of a challenge with that, with that term because I think it gets bastardized. Yeah. But the tactical athlete, that is the person that is actually in the field doing the work that depends on their physical, mental, spiritual uh, ability to get through the job, the win there is measured much, much differently. Yeah. And by yeah. you know, by proxy, so is the loss. It is it mm-hmm. is much, much more devastating than maybe somebody's pocketbook or you know, lack of entertainment or emotional state at the end of the day. Yeah. So it's really it's it's very cool to hear that you're in a position where you're able to 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 make an impact. How is that going, man? Like how do you how, how do you measure success in the in the in the realm that you're in there right now? What what does that even look like? Is it is it well defined or is it are you still having to try to kind of I don't know if this is the right word, but maybe even convince people like what success really looks like or means in the field that you're in right now? So I, uh, first of all, let me define success for myself because when I got out of the hospital, my yeah, definition of success was the simple pursuit of happiness because I was so unhappy for so long, right? That's led me down that dark road. So it started real simple with that pursuit of happiness. And that's kind of the road that I'm still on. Um, but what makes me happy is what I've realized over these last 10 years. What makes me happy now is being in a position where I get to share my passion for fitness, but then also my shortcomings and downfalls that I've had in life and what I've been able to do with that. Um, that to me is defining success because when I go to work every day, I have stressful days, I have long days, but I don't feel like I'm working because at the end of the day, I know I'm making a difference. So when I get home, yep. I'm proud of what I did. I don't ever feel like I'm just like going to work to just go to work ever. And I've had those jobs and I've left them in a heartbeat because for me, that's not a life I want to live because I almost ended my life. So I realized how quick this thing could be over, right? So I'm trying to be as intentional as I can. Now, I know there's ways I could probably do better with my business because I'm still very like, I'm an emotional dude. So if you need help, I'm here, right? I want to help people, but sometimes that comes at my own detriment. And that's something that I'm still learning how to do. Um, because a couple of years ago, I really, I was, I had a small, like everything was really small, my footprint. And then just like overnight, my Instagram blew up organically. I made a post and my post hit. And then all of a sudden I went from like having like okay. 1200 followers to like almost, I think like 30, almost 30,000 where it's like, it's wild and, how that works, that, right? Yeah, and and that's like, a weird I don't place. know what happens. And so I started feeling like I got to pump content. I got to pump content. I got to do all this stuff. So I did for like consistently. I think I posted stuff daily for over a year and it just burned me out. Um, so this last yep. year, my my social media and stuff, I just kind of put a wayside to it. And I sat back and I talked with my wife and I'm like, listen, this year I'm just kind of starving off what's not meant for me. Um, be it relationships, business partners, business opportunities, because when stuff would come up, I'd jump at it. And then I would think it would be reciprocated, right? But then it got back to me, hey, my job is to give without the expectation of receiving in return. So if I'm not doing that, I need to starve that thing off. And um, it opened my eyes to a lot of things as far as where I stood with certain things and just life in general. And not for good or bad, just for what it was and where I was at and what I needed to do. And um, I, my, my goals have always changed. My business when I started it is different than what it was in the beginning compared to what it is now. My work with the Marine Corps is different. Got it. You know, but one thing that I'll say is when I feel like I'm a servant, man. So when I feel like my service is done in one area, I have no problem moving on to the next one. Um, because I feel like even what I'm doing now, I'm meant to impact people in a much bigger way. I just don't know what that is yet. And my prayer really is to just have the people come into my life who are supposed to help me figure that out and just to continue to have the courage to share because it's like, if I, I've had anxiety all day, like, because I knew what we were going to talk about and not because I'm like, Oh my God, I don't want to do it, but it's still hard for me. It's not like I'm sitting here saying, 
yeah, dude, I got through all this stuff and life kicks ass and I'm so successful. I still have hard days. Like, and I'm only successful because I define success on my terms and my definition. Because there's other people who look at me and probably don't think I'm successful, but okay, whatever. Because if you're just chasing just money or just this or just that, like, I might not think you're successful. And at the end of the day, like, opinions to me only matter when they come from valued people, right? And one thing about the internet is I feel you, brother, because I've told my wife so many times I want to delete my Instagram, but I can't do it because I put so much work into it. And then I'll get a message from someone who's like, dude, you are really helping me. Right. So it's like, all right, I need to do this. So it's like reframing how I'm going about my work. And even now, like, I feel like going into 2024, it's more about just sharing this other side of me. Because when you look at me, like tattooed body, tattooed hands, like big, dense guy, Marine Corps strength and conditioning coach. When I talk to you about my feelings, it pushes you on your heels. And when it comes from me, it's almost like that smack in the mouth that people get that are like, whoa, what's happening here? And it's like, well, it just drops the guard, right? And I've accepted now in my life that that is the role in this season that I'm supposed to play. I'm supposed to be an icebreaker, right? I'm supposed to be an icebreaker. I'm supposed to be the one who's saying, hey, guys, right? Because at the time I was at my worst, I was looking for that person and they were nowhere to be found. And now I am a person who can Mm -hmm. do that. And that's my why. So with my business or my work with the Marine Corps, it's to provide a service that was not there for me because maybe people just weren't able to do it. But now I am. So I will. I don't even know what the success is, man, but I'm just along for the ride and I'm just trying to be a good guy and and leave it better than I found it, honestly. uh, and that's how we started the show. And that's exactly why I wanted to talk to you. And and, and, and there's so many things that you just said right there. And, and part of what I'm taking away from that is the like the timing piece and kind of how mm-hmm. things li- end up lining up. And I, there's it's very interesting for me in my own life and my, my, the, my own sort of just even with the show and kind of where it is right now, how folks end up you know, or just I, I think those 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 points end up connecting, or those dots end up connecting in life. This was like a a perfect moment because you know while I will I will oft I will sometimes have, and it's not it's not often, but I will sometimes have guests on the show that can speak to the things that you've you've talked about today, and are very open about doing that in their own journey. They're super humble. Um, there's some emotion wrapped up in this clearly and obviously, and I think that's so important. And the the timing of it is what's really interesting to me because I, I think I mentioned at the beginning, we, we connected through social media and it was through an interesting, it's just an interesting way. It was something that was completely off topic, right? Mm-hmm. To, to any of this. But I think for a lot of people, it ends up coming at a time where it's the most important time for them to hear the message. I for needed sure. to hear the message again. It puts us in a position to be able to share the message again and, and put it in front of people that may not be expecting it, but also need it right now at this particular mm-hmm. time. And, you know, there could be a lot of people out there listening to it. Well, that's not what I signed up for today. Like they may have signed off from this podcast a long time ago and that's fine because it's, maybe it's not for you, but there's going to be people out yeah. there where it is for them. And, and the, I, again, listening to the journey and understanding they're not alone and understanding that like it look like being bitter and resentful and all those things is certainly part of the process. It doesn't have to be there forever. But what you mm-hmm. just said there at the end about like you don't have to have it all fucking figured out all the time. Yeah. You don't. And you know, you know, quit putting your put it, quit putting that pressure on yourself to have to have it figured out. You know, in a world where going back to the social media thing, there's this false sense of reality of well these the, all these people seemingly have it figured out it's which re, in the reality of it it's a highlight reel and that highlight reel mm-hmm. is false all the time it's it spins them on this road of again going back to the beginning like I'm not good enough and I'm not doing yeah. enough and I need to be working harder and I need to be suffering more and all that kind of bullshit or at the end of the day it just it just takes you sucks you deeper and deeper into this hole yeah. so you know at the end of the day like I love that statement like man I don't even know like I don't yeah. know, but I'm okay not no, not knowing um, yeah. because I get to wake up every day. I get to go impact people. I get to go, you know, mm-hmm. I I I'm, I I get to love and continue to love what I'm doing, and I know I'm having an impact because people are giving me feedback or I'm seeing these things. I'm getting these messages, mm-hmm. dude. At the end of the day, that's that's what it should be all all, all about. Yeah. I don't. 
again, going back to me, that game of comparison is a is an evil bitch. Like I don't, yeah. I don't really care what other people are doing, because mm. if if I can meet a guy and talk to a dude that, who is just trying to leave the better the world a better place than he found it, like you're doing, that's success to me. Like, yeah, I, and I wouldn't have had that opportunity otherwise. So, um, you know, I I, I don't know. I don't, there's no question to that. It's just a statement and kind of an acknowledgement of what you're saying. Is like, bro, I feel you, and I. I, I think there's a lot of people that want to feel the same way you feel. Mm-hmm. They just can't figure it out. It's they they yeah. cannot uh, for whatever reason. Yeah, and um, sometimes right, hey, when listen. you're stuck, it's one of those things, man. It's when you're stuck, it's it's scary. But if if that's the case, and that's someone listening to this, I want to encourage you to to reach out because that's why we do these things too, right? So reach out, reach out. My whole story here was saying that all these things were because I wasn't talking about how I was feeling or all of these other things. Reach out, man. You can reach out to me on Instagram. I won't judge you. I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, if you need someone to talk to, just all you got to do is just put it out there. That's how we met. Like you said, that's how we met. We just threw it yep. out there, man. <laughs> right? So you're so not going to know unless so, you try. So, so, to pre- so appreciative of that. And I mean, uh, hopefully people get that about you. Like, you are sincere about that. Like, this is not, this is not some Very BS so. line. Like, you're... You, you really do mean that or you probably wouldn't even be on this call. You'd probably be or on this, this podcast. You'd probably be doing something else, trying to make money or, or focus your mm-hmm. energy in something you know where there was an expectation that we were going to get a ton back. So I think it's yeah. actually a really good place to ask. So, you know, like for us, it was really easy to connect. I mean, to be honest, you know, and just telling the story the you know, you had reached out to me about a podcast that you listened to, which by the way, for me, like I, I remember pushing the mic away from us, going, "That was awful." Like I, we were, we seemed unfocused. But at the end of the day, I always know the message that we're giving is very, very sincere, mm-hmm. and it's coming from a good place. I just don't feel like we always delivered in the best way. And you hit me like, "Hey, man, I listened to this thing," and uh, you know, it really hit me because it, you know, it's the things that I know people want to hear, but they don't necessarily want to hear. It's not all the sexy stuff. And I was like, yep. "Dude, thanks for acknowledging that, man. I appreciate mm-hmm. that." Like when people reach out, and give me feedback and. And again, I think I acknowledge on that in that in that message. Like, I know that wasn't our best podcast, but the fact that you took that away makes me feel good about that. That is the thing that people should be doing more: reaching out mm-hmm. to people and just letting them know how things do impact them, um, because it reinforces the things that they're doing and, and it helps them make these connections. And so, yeah. with that, to make more connections, because that's really what this show is really about from the get go. Um, and I mean that in the, the just the platform that that I I happen to have now. How do people reach out, man? Where do you want them to go? Where do they? How how do they? How do they get contact with you and get more Andrew uh, in their life? So I only use Instagram because, like you said, I got a lot going on, and it's the easiest way to follow me. So my Instagram handle is Siepka Ludus. Um, I'm sure you're going to have my name in there, but that's S I E P K A. Yep. I know it sounds like word soup, but um, yeah, and I'm very, like you said, you gave me a great compliment when you said you were looking at my Instagram and it just seems like just a regular dude who's just trying to go through it because that's the message I'm trying to portray. I'm not trying to be an influencer. I'm just trying to be a regular guy willing to share his life. Um, so I, I thank you for that compliment because I want people to feel comfortable enough to comment to me, to write to me, to message me and know that I will write back that I'm not this dude who's like, you know, oh, I do all this stuff. I'm just, I'm a regular guy. There's nothing special about me at all. I've gone through some things in life and I've found ways to navigate it and I'm willing to share it. If you're, if you're, if you're a person that's, you know, into the training game, uh, looking mm-hmm. to be more fit, more resilient, strong, uh, with endurance, uh, you know, that, that understands how to hand, handle the, also the mental capacity that, that, or it, it, that's needed, in order to get through all that, that that's your game. That's what you love doing. Yep. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I'm sure there's there's ways. Uh, you know, getting into the uh, the the talking shop. I'm sure is something that I, I I mean, we did a little bit of that earlier. You know, before the call, like mm-hmm. I, I, you're super passionate about it. And I dig that about you because you know you, you come with this interesting background, but you're also like you're you're a nerd, like just like me when it comes yeah, to this when time. it comes to the fitness and the, and <laughs> the, the, the human performance stuff. Um, and, and sometimes I lose sight of that. Like, but when I get to connect with somebody who understands it, really loves it, I, I, it, it, it stirs up my motor as well and, and kind of gets me running. So if you're one of those people who wants to know a little bit more about, uh, how to be a beast, cause this dude's, a, I, I've seen some of your stuff, like you're a beast of a dude. Like it was, I was actually shocked when you said like, you're, 
you know, your, your height and weight, like what'd you say you're five, seven and like 200 pounds or something. Yeah, I did. I just did a bot and body assessment. So five, seven, uh, 196 actually. And like 12% body fat somewhere around there. And I'm 38. Yeah. Dude. So still moving pretty yeah, good for my age. You're a beast. I mean, you're a beast. So, <laughs> I mean, just, you know, for, for whatever it's worth, like, I think that's, that's something to, uh, I think that's something to, you know, to respect and, and, you know, to cut, kind of, hold in reverence with regard to, you know, talking to a guy who's been through all these things, continues to do it, can continue to do the same things that you're doing now. Um, uh, you know, a, a great resource. So, man, I, I said at the beginning, I'd probably overdo this. So I'll say it again. I cannot thank you enough for your time, for your transparency, for, for the vulnerability, you know, that you bring, you know, that you're bringing to the table and the willingness to, to not just spend time with me, but also, you know, to, to reach out and help other people if they're if if they need or, or, or want that from you. So, man, Andrew, I, I don't know what else to say. Is there anything you want to leave us with? I want to throw that thanks right back to you, brother. Thank you for giving me a platform to share because it just honestly, like it just feels like a long time coming. I've got so much inside of me that I just haven't been able to share with the world or share it in the way that I, you know, feel that it it's needed. And I'm just grateful to have the opportunity to be on here with you, to spend some time with you, to make this great connection. Um, for the listeners who've listened, thank you. You can reach out to me for the ones who didn't make it through. Hopefully they come back around, you know? So thank you for giving me the opportunity to plant some seeds, man. And I hope that, uh, you know, this is helpful to whoever needed to hear it. My pleasure. Uh, anytime. Uh, and the next time I'm out in, uh, in Hawaii, and I hope to make that make that happen really soon. Um, I'd love to connect with you in person, man. Let's go through a training session. That would be session. awesome go hang out and uh, spend some good time. Thanks, man. Yeah, my pleasure, brother.